Hello and uh, welcome back. Uh, so this is part two. Uh, I've been asked to do a little bit more. Um, so my name is Talon and uh, I'm going to tell you another little story uh, about what I've been up to. Uh, so following on from the first one, if you didn't, uh, if you haven't seen it, then very briefly I was a PE teacher back in 2003, loving life, uh, hoping to go on to become a head teacher um, and I had all these dreams and aspirations about what I wanted to do. Uh, then a week after that photograph, I had a motorcycle accident. Uh, I was on my way to a rugby match. Uh, obviously I didn't get there and my life took a very different turn. Uh, I ended up in hospital. Uh, I'm now paralysed from this level down. Uh, and when I went to hospital, uh, I went through all of those uh, feelings and emotions um, associated with traumatic change uh, from anger uh, through to resentment and frustration uh, and to hatred, uh, hating the world, hating who I was uh, and all of those people that could do the things that I couldn't do, which was simply get up and walk about. Obviously, I don't know that, don't hate the world at all. Um, and I found out that there's lots of things I can do. Uh, but at the time, I was really unsure of what I could do and I didn't know the opportunities that were out there. Um, I did find out about skiing and off I went. Um, one of the things that I thought was never, ever uh, going to happen again was obviously riding a motorcycle uh, because you're paralysed. You can't possibly ride a motorbike. Um, but then in 2005, uh, I was out in Winter Park uh, for a bit of training and I went on a snowmobile. And you sit a soft drive the snowmobile and you use a thumb throttle and the whole thing was wheeling about. And I, and I managed to stay on it. And I thought, you know, if I could stay on this snowmobile, um, I remember riding a motorbike and, uh, and that was far, far less uh, sort of balanced. Anyway, it was an idea uh, back in 2005. And that sort of sort of stayed with me and I started to think about it and I started to to wonder if it was possible for someone who was paralysed to ride a motorcycle again. And then, being the competitive type that I am, I thought, I wonder if it's possible for someone who's paralysed to race a motorcycle. And I would have, and I would race against able-bodied. So, um, you know, the more I looked into it, and the more I asked people, the more people said, no, it's not possible, and uh, it's never going to happen. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, uh, at the time, uh, I was I was I developed this step by step method uh, that I used to go from where I was in bed to the 2010 Winter Paralympics. That was the step by step method that I was following, and I thought, well, I can just use the same method to plan from this crazy idea of getting back on a motorbike all the way through to racing a motorbike. So I started to ask more people about what would be the best way, and the you know the most progressional way for me to go from not even riding through to racing. And they explained about the different types of motorcycles and different types of racing. Uh, and I started to formulate a plan and I thought, you know what, let's head into the step-by-step -step method and, uh, and see if it's possible. Now, a few years after uh, the, the idea, I finally got to a point where I thought, you know what, I think I'll do it. And so I went into the showrooms and I looked around and I tried to find a suitable motorcycle. Um, I couldn't find a suitable motorbike, so I bought the most powerful bike I could possibly get, which at that time was a GSX-R1000 K6. So completely ludicrous, completely uh, the wrong thing that I should have done. But at the time I was carried away. I was like, oh, I'm gonna get the, the latest and greatest. Um, so this is a hundred and, well, at the time, it was 170 horsepower, it was 1,000 cc, and it was far more than I ever needed. But, you know, shiny, shiny, got distracted. Maybe should have got something slightly smaller, but at the time, I didn't know any better. So I bought this bike, 1,000 cc, and then I needed to adapt it for my use. And obviously I can't move below here, so I had to think of other things I could use in order for me to be able to ride it. Um, and the first thing that I needed to do was obviously changing gear. 
Um, so there is an electronic solenoid um, uh, with a little piston that sticks out the bottom. Uh, and when you press buttons on the handlebars, the piston goes backwards and forwards, and that helps to change the gear. So you've got the you've got the buttons here, and this is the little piston uh, above the sort of operated gear lever, and that will change the gear for me. Uh, and then I was worried about the rear brake, so I couldn't use my right foot to do the rear brake. So there are various different options. One of them is called a K-Lever 2 system, and that's this one over here. Uh, and you can see that there are two levers. So the top one is the front brake, and the bottom one is the rear brake. And then there was the case of uh, coming to a stop. Um, now, I have looked on videos uh, on YouTube and various other things, and I see that there was a person in America who had a set of these landing legs. And I sort of looked, and I... I uh, copied them. I copied the idea and built these little retractable landing legs which were at the back of the bike and when you pressed a button a little actuating arm would hopefully swing the legs up and out of the way uh, and I had no idea if this was going to work. Um, the other thing I needed to do was to put my feet uh, and if you can see just about there um, where the foot pegs are um, I thought about different ways of holding my feet in and I came up with the idea of Let's have an old set of bicycle toe clips. Uh, and the bicycle toe clips would stop my feet sliding forward. So I put Velcro on the, the foot peg and then I put Velcro on the bottom of my boot. Um, at the time I wasn't travelling very fast so I didn't worry too much about my legs. Uh, but then I, I subsequently found out that I needed to do more things in a bit. So those are the basic adaptions that I thought might work. And I went up to a disused airfield uh, and I only had my, uh, had my godson, his mother and his sister and they were there to help me. No one else knew that I was doing it because I didn't want a lot of people to know that I was doing it in case it failed uh, because it would have just been a big waste of time and energy uh, and I certainly didn't, certainly didn't need my parents finding out because uh, obviously mum and dad would be a little bit stressed about me getting back on a motorbike. Uh, when uh, they saw the motorcycle as something that caused my paralysis. So I went to a disused airfield in Cornwall, it was a beautiful sunny day, got on the bike, went to start it, nothing happened. Obviously the, the actuator of the gear shifter and also the actuator of the rear uh, stabiliser legs drained the battery because motorcycles only have a really small battery. So luckily we got the guy to come along and he jump started the bike and got the bike going and it was time for me to ride and I was I was I wasn't worried about me I was just worried that it wasn't going to work I wasn't worried about hurting myself I just thought have I wasted my time and effort and my money in this project that was my main concern as it was, turned out, it was fine. I drove off, a bit wobbly, the landing legs came up, and then I started riding again. And I felt free. I felt the freedom that two wheels gives me. Oh, it was a truly magical moment. The moment only lasted about five minutes because uh, unfortunately the landing legs failed and I fell off. So uh, five minutes though, Five minutes changed everything. Five minutes changed my attitude. It made me realise that it was possible. You know, and sometimes you have to push yourself. You have to take yourself out of your comfort zone. You have to take a risk. Obviously, it was a it was a, you know, it was an educated risk. I had you know done some research. I had planned it. And I you know gone through everything, and I was wearing all the leathers and the helmet and everything, so I was protected. Uh, so it wasn't sort of a dangerous risk, but it was a risk nevertheless. And but the re the reward that I got back from realizing that I could actually ride a motorcycle was incredible. From that, oh, I went to Castle Coombe because I was living in Bath at the time, and I spoke to the instructors there and said, you know, would it be possible for me to come to the circuit and to ride during lunchtime? 
during your track days. And they agreed, and so I went there, and then I gradually started to improve. Uh, and we got rid of the landy legs because we realised that they, they weren't always, they were always, uh, they didn't always work, and sometimes they came down uh, by themselves when the electrical stuff failed because of you know the wiring and all the rest of it. So we developed a system where two people would hold the motorcycle, one at the front and one at the back. And when it was time for me to go, I would put the bike into gear, the person at the front would move to one side, and the person at the back would hold the motorbike, and then I would just drive off out of their hands. And once you're moving, you're balanced. Uh, and then the same people were there when I came back into the pits, you know, they would stand there with their arms up, and I would aim for the person, I would catch the bike at the same time as you would catch the bike. So we called these people the launch crew, and we developed this system of me being able to start and stop with two people, which was fantastic. So then I, I didn't have to worry about the landing legs and whether or not they'd come up and whether or not they were going to come down at the end of each session. And I gradually started to improve. What I then needed to do was to get some better instruction. Um, obviously, the uh, instructors at Castleton were fantastic. Um, but as with everything, you've got to go and find, you know, the real true experts. And luckily for me, uh, on one of the days I was out on a track day, I had uh, this chap, and he's called Sylvan Quintoli, and he is a MotoGP racer. So he's raced at the pinnacle of racing. And he came out um, and he spent some time with me instructing. And I have had other people. And I've gone and done things like California Superbike School. I've had Mars Mike Edwards. So all of these people were helping me to develop my riding so that I would be smooth and fast. Because if you're smooth, you're generally fast. Because one of the things I wasn't going to do was turn up to go racing and be a mobile chicane. I didn't want uh, to be in a position where I would cause problems to other racers. Uh, so I wanted to know that when I got to a, 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 a pace that was suitable, I would seamlessly fit in to the racing along with everybody else. I wouldn't be this awkward sort of mobile chicane that everyone had to sort of worry about. Um, uh, and that was something that I was going to be able to put forward to the Autocycle Union. And then to start off with, when I first applied to the Autocycle Union, they said, no, it's, you know, we, we don't, we're not sure that we can have paraplegics racing. Uh, and they listed a whole load of, you know, issues that they had with someone who was paralysed going out and racing. Um, but they said, you know what we'll do is we'll let you have a, a sprint licence and a hill climb licence so you can go and do hill climbs and sprints. Because with this racing you go one at a time. So it doesn't matter if anything happens to you when out, you're out on circuit or out on this track or out on the hill climb because it's only one person going at a time and they wouldn't start the next rider until you had finished. And so this was my first experience of racing and the first experience of racing was at Kerbera in 2011 uh, and I had my uh, good friend Russ along with me uh, who was helping me to launch me from the timing beam and there to catch me when we got back and it was only him and me you know we had to rely on uh, the uh, friendship and the, and the motorcycle family of, of the other people that were there the other racers that were there to, to help us when I came back in uh, and this is a big thing about the motorcycle fraternity, is that everybody supports each other uh, and I'm eternally grateful to those people uh, because without their support, without Piers, Russell uh, and, 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 and all the people that have gone on since, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to do it alone. But it was the first time I took part in a competitive race. Um, I, I think I came last. Um, but you know, I wasn't embarrassed. Uh, so I then started to continue to practice and I started to race something called a mini twin. So it's a SV650 uh, and it was limited to 72 and a half horsepower. And we believed this was going to be the way that I could get into racing and it would develop my race craft. Uh, I then had assistance from uh, Dave Stewart with Thunder Sport GB, uh, Dave and Sid. And they then helped me to write a proposal to the Autocycle Union to cover all of the various uh, problems that were being brought up. You know, we had to address each and every one of them. And I had to compromise. So uh, it got to a point where finally 
the ACU agreed uh, and they gave me my license and uh, in 2012 I made history by becoming the first true paraplegic to gain an ACU race license and to go out and compete against able-bodied racers. And so some of the con you know, concessions that I had to make was that I was going to start from the pit lane. And so here we've got uh, Colin, uh, Colin who's also racing with uh, Thunder Sport GB. Uh, he was helping me uh, and guiding me and being supportive uh, and he was there at the start and I had to start from the pit lane. So everyone else went on to the grid uh, and then when they started, as the last person went past Sid, who's got the green flag there, Sid would wave his green flag and off I went and I would join the race. Uh, and, you know, I was last by miles at the end of the first lap. Um, but by the end of the race, I'd actually caught up and overtaken about eight other riders. And so, uh, do, do, you know, we looked at it and Sid and Dave and they were like, you know what, I'll tell you what, let's, let's see if we can get you to start at the back of the grid. And so then, my launch crew would be at the back of the grid. They would hold me, and then when the lights went out, I joined the race straight away. So I didn't have to wait until everyone had gone past the, the pit lane exit. Um, and it was uh, Sid and Dave who took the risk. You know, they took a risk on me as well. And you know, they said that you know if there was a problem, it would be on their license. And the concessions that I made was then that I always start at the back of the grid. Uh, I was limited to 72 and a half horsepower, so that meant you know, I could race the Mini Twins. I could only race at certain circuits, so mainly circuits that didn't have a lot of gravel, uh, because the ACU were concerned that if I went into the gravel, then I would have a great deal of difficulty to get out of it. Um, so those were the concessions that I made. And so for the first two years of racing, uh, I didn't do more than three or four races uh, in an actual year um, because of the concessions that I was having to make. But I was there and I was racing. And at the end of the very first race, um, most of the racers come in through a, a shortened version of the circuit. Uh, I had to go all the way around it because it meant coming in through the paddock and, and that was just too dangerous. So I came around the full length of the circuit and all the marshals came out and they were waving their flags as though I'd won the, the world championship. So that I just, I just burst into tears. Um, it had been so emotional uh, to get there because I was told that I couldn't do it, and then maybe I could, and then I couldn't, and and it was up and down all the way, even to the you know the day that I went on the race. I was still nervous that the, you know, the governing body was going to stop me from doing this, to stop me from achieving this goal that I set myself. And it was such a relief to do it, not just for me, but for all the paraplegics that I knew that loved running and that would love to race. And I thought, well, if I've done it, they will be able to do it as well. Um, and what was really special on that particular day is the, this chap here, right? At the time, he's 15 years old and he's called Josh Daly. And um, he came up to me and he gave me the trophy that he won for the race that I was in, because the race had uh, different classes in it. So there was um, 400s, uh, Mini Twins and Super Twins. And, and he won the race on the 400. And he gave me the trophy that he won. Um, it was a very special moment. And I've still got the trophy. Uh, and I know that Josh is now racing in the roads. He does the TT. It's fantastic to see the person that he's become. But a true gentleman, and it just went to show what sort of people are there at the racing, you know, 15 year old lad takes it upon himself to come up and give me his trophy and it made the world to me, it really did. And it just, it brought home how special uh, racing was. So I then started to try and improve and get quicker. And, you know, what I found is that some people didn't even realize I was paralyzed. So this particular race is at Cadwell Park and I had a real old ding dong uh, with this guy behind me. We had battles overtaking each other non-stop uh, throughout the entire race. It was absolutely fantastic. And I went to go and find him afterwards to say how much I enjoyed racing with him. Uh, and I wheeled up, I saw his bike and I wheeled up to the, the gazebo that he was in. And I said, oh, hi, you know, I just wanted to say what a great race. And he looked at me, he goes, oh, what, did you see it from the side? I said, no, I was, I was out there racing with you. He goes, yeah, but you're in a wheelchair. I said, I was, I was number 74. We were overtaking each other all the time. 
and he couldn't believe it. He thought, oh, I just, I just thought you were riding old school, you like not moving, because some riders do, they just sit stock still and they don't get off the bike. And he said, that's the only thing I could think about. I didn't think that you were in any other way, uh, I just thought you were a racer. And that was fantastic to realise that people just thought I was a racer. And that's all I sort of ever wanted to do was just to be a racer. And it was it was a wonderful thing for me. And, and he couldn't believe it. He was absolutely stoked. We went out and we had even more great races during that uh, during that weekend. And so it's amazing to see people's attitude were beginning to change. And, and, and it was very important for me to realise that other people just saw me as a racer rather than anything else. <sighs> However... The bike I'm very good at crashing on skis. Turns out I'm also quite spectacular at crashing on a motorbike. Um, in 2013, I was racing at Assen. It was an endurance race, and we were the, uh, a disabled racing team when I was on the last leg, and I was 20 minutes away from finishing this endurance race. And I had a mechanical failure. The rear wheel, uh, I, went, well, I went into a false neutral going into a corner. So the bike was just freewheeling. So I went in really, really fast. Um, and as I basically came, as, as the bike was leant over at its maximum, the, the gears re-engaged and it locked the rear wheel. So the back wheel came back on me uh, and the bike flipped. It's called a high side. So the bike flipped. Now at the time, what I discovered is that as you go quicker and quicker, the knees started to flap about and you start to move in the seat. So we used to put straps the front of the knee so on a set of leathers normally on your outside knee there is a, a hard sort of puck um, a bit like an ice hockey puck and it's called a knee slider and that is where people sort of get their knee out and put it down and it slides across the ground and they know that that's their their angle their maximum angle that they should be sort of riding at obviously for us we don't for i say us for paraplegics you're not sticking your knee out but what you do need is you need to be stable so we would take the Velcro patch off with the, with the puck, as it were, and uh, we would attach straps to the sides of the bike and then wrap them around our knees with the Velcro straps. So that stopped the legs from being pulled out. What I hadn't realised is that Velcro can be really, really strong. And so in this particular race, when the bike came round and flipped and high-sided and started to somersault, I expected to come off the bike. Uh, the Velcro, however, held me on the bike. And so the bike was somersaulting down the track uh, and I was strapped to the bike and I couldn't come away from it. And I've got 200 odd kilos of motorcycle slamming me repeatedly into the ground. Um, I honestly, at the time I thought I was dead. I, I thought I was going to die. And it was, uh, it was a true miracle that I did it. And I know some people might not believe what I'm going to say. So my brother passed away uh, back in 2008. Um, and when I had the accident, when I was flying through the air, it felt as though, I don't know how, I don't know, I mean, the only way I can describe it is that I felt as though my brother was sat behind me and he put his arms up and he was protecting me from being slammed into the tarmac. I just felt this protection and I felt his presence. Yes, I was being smashed to pieces, but I felt him then sort of basically saving me. Um, and when we, when, I, well, I say, when, we, when I finally came to a stop, um, you know, I, I was winded, I could barely breathe, uh, they stopped the race, uh, some of the marshals thought I was dead because of the severity of the, what they'd just seen and I wasn't moving obviously. Um, and they got the bike off me and uh, we found out that uh, you know, my, my legs were pointing in very, very odd uh, directions, you know, which, which made the marshals think I was dead because I wasn't screaming or anything. Um, but you know, when they when I finally saw that I could start moving, I lifted up my cracked my visor open and they were like, oh my God, he's still alive. And they got the ambulance and they took me to um, uh, the hospital in Assen. And uh, on the way there, I lost consciousness. Uh, I was taken in and 
apparently I was you know I was operated on straight away um, because the I shattered the right femur and the bones had nearly uh, had nearly cut this femoral artery, uh, which would mean I'd have to go for the rest of my deferments. So they operated on that one straight away, uh, and then what they then found out is that I'd shattered the left ankle. Um, the next day I was woken up. I finally sort of came around from the operation of uh, having the right leg pinned, uh, and the doctor said, "Oh look, you know, we're, uh, we've had to pin your right leg. Um, you were very lucky that you didn't cut the femoral artery and could have died. So, however, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to amputate the left leg." I was like, "Oh no, why is that?" And they went, "Well, you shattered the bone so badly in the in the ankle and the foot that we can't recreate a walkable ankle joint. So we're going to have to to cut it off so that." Um, you'll have to walk with a prosthetic. So I thought, don't, let's, let's not worry about that, I'm not going to walk again. And they were there saying, well, you know, don't be so defeatist, you know, it'll, it'll take time, but we need to, you know, get you mobile again. And uh, But that ankle is too badly shattered, it won't work, you've got to amputate it. I said, look, I'm never going to walk again. And they were saying, look, you've, you've got to think positive, you've got to think positive about this. I know you've had a bad accident, but think positive. I said, guys, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm paralysed, I can't even feel my legs. At which point they had a freak out. They went, oh my God, how do we miss your paralysis? And they sort of immobilized me straight away. And I was like, oh, it's calm down, calm down. It's like, it's all right. I was paralyzed before I got on the motorbike. And I explained to them and sort of everyone calmed down and they let me keep my leg. I mean, I know they don't work, but I quite like the symmetry of it. Uh, so they put me into, uh, uh, they put the cage around my left leg. And, uh, look, and, and the bones, yeah. Maybe it would have been easier for me to have amputated because it took, it's, it's actually taken six years for me not to wear a brace on my left leg. I mean, and that was in 2013. So we're in 2020 now. It was only last year that I finally uh, got to take off the brace for my left leg. It's not, it's been a long old journey. And uh, so I finally got back to the UK and yeah, started my rehabilitation. And, and loads of people said, well, that, that's you and bikes. I've done, maybe you should think of something else, maybe archery or table tennis or something slightly less dangerous. And I was thinking, well, maybe I should give up. And I remember what I always say to people when I give talks is that you can't ever give up. You've always got to give at least one more go because you never know what's going to happen. And I'd only just started out on my racing career. And I was thinking, maybe if I, if I give up, maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resent that. I'm going to, to I don't know if I can achieve it. And so I decided not to give up. I would always give it at least one more go. Uh, I then managed to get some funding uh, for the race team and we were supported by some solicitors and, uh, and I started to improve again. So I'd reached a level and then I had the accident and I came back down took me a while to build up my confidence again and also I was sat differently so I've still got a brace on my left leg so I had a, a like a carbon fiber uh, support on my leg and so it used to hold it wouldn't allow the ankle to bend so my left leg sat at a slightly different height than my right leg and so you know I had to learn to ride with my legs and my hips at a slightly different angle but found a way around it and suddenly discovered that I could go a little bit quicker. I, I, got, I got my confidence back um, I was, and, and we learned that we didn't need quite so much hard code on the knees. Um, and then we started to grow the team. So it wasn't just me. Uh, we got another paraplegic, Steve. Uh, and then we had a leg amputee, Louis. Uh, and then we got another team member, uh, Will, who's another leg amputee. So eventually, by the end of 2015, there were four of us racing. In the racing, which we call talent racing, and um, it was a film made, and it was called Dream the Impossible, um, and uh, you know you can go and see it. It's, uh, it's about ninety minutes long. Uh, we don't make any money from it. We don't get it, you know. But uh, the, the production company that made it, Speechless, is a fantastic film, and actually, it's a really lovely film about four stories of four individuals of how they had their lives changed, and each one of us is injured through a motorcycle. And each one of us has got back on a bike and now races a motorcycle. So quite an interesting story uh, of, 
individuals, their stories of resilience and the challenges that they've overcome in order to, to look like they were very much either paralysed or, or caused their uh, amputation uh, and go on to race them. Um, yeah, we were, I was very pleased to be part of such a wonderful project. Uh, my own racing continued, I started to improve, uh, I then started to race a different type of bike and so now because we, I did the groundwork um, with the order side unit, so anyone who is paralysed now can just basically get their licence from a club and go off and race at any state website. You know, I'm now racing a 600 and I've become an AC race instructor. So that's me now instructing someone who is able-bodied how to be a quicker racer. And you know, I instruct all different types uh, of, of races and uh, ages as well. So from 13 years old all the way up to sort of 50 year olds, uh, I'll instruct whoever's, whoever's there. You know, I'll, I'll go along and, and instruct and, and try to help them become a, a, a faster and safer racer. Um, but I did need to do something else. I needed to put the demons to rest, finally. So what I did was I went and bought a bike. It was an exact copy of the bike that I was paralysed on. Converted to a race bike. We then I then painted it exactly the same colours as the bike that I was paralysed on. Called it Doris, because Doris isn't a too scary name. And then Doris and I went out and we went racing. And Doris and I did really, really well together. The very last race that Doris and I did together, uh, before I, I sold Doris, um, we qualified in third in our class. Couldn't believe it. That was a, practically a front row start. Um, but I had to start in 44th all the way at the back because I'm, you know, I'm still starting from the back of the grid. But I didn't want to give up. I didn't want to just say, you know what, okay, I'm going to start from the back of the grid, never mind. I'm going to fight it. And it was really wet conditions. Uh, and Doris and I did exceptionally well, and in the first lap we overtook 29 riders. Well, we made 29 places further forward, so um, that was an incredible start, and I carried on and I finished sixth overall. So it's amazing what you can do if you don't give up. You keep on fighting, you know, even sometimes when you get your setbacks, which for me is always start at the back of the grid. Um, but being able to put those steamers to rest and, um, and, and finally realising that I am in charge of my life, not an accident. Um, I'm the person that makes the choices uh, and that was very, that was a very worthwhile risk to take. And out of everything so far that I've done, the greatest thing has been this, the bike experience. So when I started to do track days, I started to realise the immense feelings of freedom that I was getting. And I knew there had to be other people out there that would enjoy the same feeling, but maybe they, you know, they didn't have the same uh, access uh, to, to funds to buy a bike or uh, to people to help them. And so I set up the bike experience. Uh, I went with uh, Russ, who had helped me on my very first race, and we created the bike experience to advise and teach disabled people how to ride motorcycles. And since the very first uh, sort of day, um, the first session we felt like, well, how much time has this now got? So we started in 2011, we're now into our ninth, tenth season. Obviously, 2020 is a bit different because we've got COVID and we're not doing anything at the moment. Uh, but we've helped over 400 disabled riders uh, get on a bike. Now, some are returning to a motorcycle, having been injured because of a bike accident. Some are coming back to riding because of some other form of injury uh, or illness, and some have gone on a bike for the very first time because they would never thought it was possible that they could ride. So, you know, they've had cerebral palsy or they've had polio or any one of, uh, you know, a hundred different reasons of why they may not have got on a bike. Um, but we have a variety of different bikes which are adaptive uh, and we can help people with disabilities. Uh, so long as you've got one arm that works, we can help uh, get them riding again. And there are also people that the, the level of their injuries is uh, such that they aren't able to ride independently. So what we do is we give them an experience. So either we sit them on the bike and we start it up and we let them rev it, or you know, uh, or whatever we can do uh, to give them an experience of being uh, 
buy a bike or sat on a bike and, and feeling the noise and the vibrations and the, the other senses that come with it, as well as riding it. Um, but it's great to see that a lot of people have uh, come through the bike experience and then gone on and done other things. So some people have come to the bike experience and then gone on to race. Some people have come to the bike experience and then gone on to ride on the road. Others have come and gone on and done different things. Um, you know, one chap came, didn't think he could ride a motorbike. We showed him that he could, and he realised that if he could ride a motorbike, he could fly a plane. And that was his true passion. So off he went, uh, and he went and started flying again. So that was fantastic to be able to give them that that uh, sort of kickstart to help them to get going again. For myself, I then carried on in 2018. Uh, there is a international world championship for disabled riders. So uh, in the UK, obviously we compete against able-bodied. We're all fully integrated. Uh, in Italy, in France, in Spain, uh, some of the disabled riders, especially the paraplegics, they have to compete in a completely separate championship. So they all compete against other disabled riders. Uh, they're not integrated with the able-bodied riders. And so they got together and they formed a, uh, a race series, a three race series uh, for the world championships and invited you know, any other disabled rider to come along. They had their own series, you know, DD, PMR, um, but then they had these three races where everyone came together for a, a world championship. And in 2018, I became the 600cc champion for the paralyzed riders. Um, and then last year, I did something which was very, very special uh, for me, which was to uh, complete a parade lap of the Isle of Man TT course. And it was a classic TT. Um, there's only been one other paraplegic that's managed it. I was able to go up and uh, enjoy wonderful conditions around the Isle of Man and do a parade lap and raise money for uh, the Bike Experience Charity. And this is me about 130 miles an hour coming down to Craigner Bar, uh, just past, I think it's Kate's Cottage, uh, Oprah's off the ground. The most truly, truly exhilarating and scary thing that I've ever done. And my average was 90 miles an hour, which we think is the fastest that a paraplegic's ever gone around there. Um, but to realise that some of the people go around there at 135 miles an hour average, it, it just blows your mind that they can go that fast. And I'm you know, truly in awe of all of the riders that we've been racing. You know, many lessons learned. Uh, the, the main thing is, is to never give up and to trust this energy that lives inside you. So we all have an energy, we all have resilience to help us keep taking the steps forwards even when we think that we can't. You know, you, you've, I call it the little person inside, you know, you've got that, that power, that energy, you, you, you've got to tap into it and use it and trust it, trust yourself. And it's amazing what you can achieve even when obstacles are put in your own way. Um, and it will be what you do that you will be remembered for, not what you say you're going to do. I mean, I could have said, yeah, I'm going to learn to ride a motorbike and never, ever done it. Um, but I have done. I've always done the things that I say I'm going to do. Uh, and that's what people remember you for. Um, and if you, if you choose to trust in yourself, if you choose to use that little person inside yourself, there is... It's nothing that you can't achieve. There is no obstacle that you can't surmount and get across. You know, you can go beyond ordinary, uh, and that's been my choice, and I hope that you will make the same choice as well. So, thank you very much for listening. Use a little person inside, believe in yourself, and go beyond ordinary.